I'm really excited to be here in New York. Uh, and uh, I always like, love coming to KubeCon. And uh, especially, it's, it's sort of a humbling experience to be part of this excellent microservices track. It's just, look, I'm lo really look, looking forward to some excellent talks. It was a great talk right before mine as well. So I'll, I'll try to add to the story by talking about you know, how you can design event-first microservices. So let's, let's sort of dive into that. It, was, it will be sort of theoretical, but, but in, in somehow also practical. As I said, I'll try to sort of break down some, some harder concepts and try to make them sort of digestible. Uh, but it's, it's more of a sort of food for thought and, 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 and for you to sort of, if you find this interesting, you know, we know which areas you, you, you should like dive, dive, dive down into and, and start exploring on your, on your own, so to speak. So you, I guess you want to do microservices. At first, I mean, hopefully it's for, the, it's for the right reasons. You know, there's a lot of hype and buzz around, mic around microservices, and, and, and rightfully so. I mean, it's, 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 it's a really nice sort of design pattern or a way to implement systems. But it's also easy to get carried away and sort of drink the Kool-Aid. I think that it's, very, it's, it's very important that you, that you sort of take a step back and think, do I need to do microservices in the, in the first place? You know, my, microservices, the right reasons to do microservices, in my opinion, is to scale the organization. You know, you sort of, sort of break it up into sort of multiple autonomous teams that can deliver software faster, more like, like where, where time to market matters, et cetera. And, and uh, not necessarily you know, to scale the system. However, if you do it right, in my opinion, then uh, I will try to show you in this talk, then you can actually get the best of both worlds. You will actually end up with, with a system that, can, that, can, that you can use to roll out features faster, more predictably, but also scale the system in a much better way and build more resilient software, you know, with using autonomous components that can fail in isolation, they can sort of, you know, sort of bounce back in isolation, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, cutting short these cascading failures that we've sometimes seen in the past using you know, JE and you know, application servers, and we really tightly coupled systems, et cetera, right? So I think, it's, I think it's important, though, that, I mean, when I'm out there, I'm saying not, not, not all, but many companies, are, when, they, when, when they go about microservices, they end up with something like this, that I call a mi micro list, where, you st where, you have, where you're, if you're going to go from a monolith to a, to, a, to a microservices system, you take all synchronous or synchronous methods, like method calls, the method dispatch calls, and you simply just replace them with, 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 with request response in a synchronous manner, synchronous RPC. And we're still, we're, and we're still used, I mean, the almighty Oracle database or, or whatever using CRUD in a fully synchronous fashion. You know, the, the problem here is you bring a lot of the problems from monoliths over to, to, over to microservices. And you maintain that strong coupling that makes it really hard to build systems that scale and, and, and are available. Okay? However, you solve the problem with scaling the organization, but you sort of miss out on all the other features or all the benefits of, of microservice, because you know, this strong coupling does limit things like scale, availability, extensibility, the maintainability, the understandability of the system. I think we can do better than this, right? And so I'll just grab this one. And I think thinking in events really can help here, I think. I mean, domain-driven design from an events-first perspective, and that's sort of the, the, the topic of this of this, of this talk. Try to sort of view the world through events and, 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 and sort of understanding what that, what that means. You know, domain-driven design, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. I mean, that was sort of coined by Eric Evans in the, I think 2003, is, did, the, did the, the, the canonical book come out. It has really served us well the last, was it, what is it, like 15 years? But the problem is that it can easily sort of lead us down the wrong path. Because it's, it, 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 it sort of puts a focus on structure too early in the design process. It, po it puts a focus on finding the domain objects, you know, finding all the nuns. I mean, I, I was, I was sort of, you, know, you know, learning computer science b back in the day when object-oriented programming was, was really, really popular. And then I was, you know, the, the first step was go out, find, find all the nuns, you know. That's the same sort of thinking in domain-driven design. And it, 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 it's nothing per se that is bad about that. It's just that in this new world of distributed systems, it, it's not the ideal way to start, I'd say. Because, it's, because, because I mean, doing that means that, that, uh, that sort of 
as I said, it focused on, on the structure of the system too early in the system, in, instead, too early in the, in the design process, instead of trying to understand what the system actually does, which is really the important thing. And Greg Young once said that when you start modeling in events, it, it forces you to think about the behavior of the system as opposed to thinking about the structure of the system. This is one of, sort of the main benefits of, 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 of events first type of design. And so we should not focus on the things, the nuns, the domain objects that we've been taught to do, but instead, so I, don't, I don't know if I need to stand here for this to work. I'll just scrap this one, sorry. Uh, instead, you should focus on, on what happens in the system. Find the verbs, and the verbs are usually the events that flow in the system. Try to understand who's communicating with who, et cetera, et cetera, right? I'll dive into what this means in, in more detail soon. But first, let's start with the basics. What is an event? I'm sure there are a zillion uh, sort of definitions, right? I'll give you mine so, so you know where I'm coming from, the, sort of the context that I'm coming from when it comes to events. You know, <clears throat> first, events represent sort of facts of information. And you know, and you know facts. That's a, a fact is something, a fact in the world, in the real world. It's, it's sort of something that has already happened, something that we can take for being the truth. It might not be the truth, you know, we can, it might be something, something that, 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 that's wrong, but it's a, something that we sort of accepted as being a fact. And so that means that facts are in, the nature of facts is that they are immutable. You cannot change a fact. You can change the fact that something has happened, so to speak. So this means that, you know, facts can only accrue. You know, knowledge can only grow. We can only learn more and more and more in life. We can, sometimes we forget, of course, but in principle, knowledge can only grow, okay? So that means that facts can only accrue. You can't delete facts, etc. cetera. If, uh, so facts, in this, in this context, I'm talking about facts as represented as events, I may say, first. And, and facts, they can be, however, disregarded. I, I can choose to not believe a certain fact. I can choose to ignore that. It might be in violation with I already think is true, etc. So I can choose to disregard facts. But once I have accepted them in this sort of conceptual framework of facts, they cannot be retracted. I can't go back and delete the fact, something that I've already sort of understood has happened, okay? And since, and since facts can't be detracted, it means that they also can't be deleted. However, I mean, with, the G, with, G, with GDPR and everything, you know, there might be reasons where when facts actually, in, in practice, has to be deleted. You know, for legal reasons like GDPR, or for moral reasons, you know, you know keeping your customers safe, etc. I have to say. But in, 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 in principle, they can't be deleted, okay? And, but, but it's also very important that new facts that arrive into the system, you know, or, or that we, as, as humans accept, can, however, invalidate existing facts. We do that every day. We learn more and we realize what we, what we, what we thought we knew in the past is actually not valid anymore. The world has moved on or we accepted some fact that's actually false, etc. right? So, to sum up, facts are immutable. Facts just, grow, just accrue, knowledge only grows. You, you, you can choose to disregard facts, but once accepted, you can't delete them. But, you, but a new facts that arrive does invalidate existing facts in some situations, okay? So, when, what should we do then? We should sort of, when we sort of come into to design process, we should sort of ask ourselves, what are the facts? Just like a detective coming into a crime scene. I mean, most people have seen CSI, right? Or, or read you know, Sherlock Holmes, right? You should try to mine them, to try to understand, I mean, causalities and things like that, what, how, what really went on in this crime scene, okay? And event storming can really help here. Event storming is sort of a, sort of a new technique came up in the, in the last years, five years or something like that. We sort of bring in all the stakeholders into one single room, physical room, you know? All the, all the, all the, all the stakeholders, meaning all the, all the domain experts, all the programmers, et cetera and you hand them post-it notes and have them sort of brainstorm about trying to find, understand well, what's going on in the, in the system from, from you know, uh, how data flows in the system, who's communicating with who, trying to mine the facts 
and, and also trying to understand the commands. I'll, 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 bring, I'll get to commands quite soon, but, 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 but sort of trying to find co co the causality between your, your, your components and the service. And, 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 the, and the service. And you know, information flow is actually business logic. That's usually where, where the value in your system resides, more than in the nuns, you know, the actual things. They can be replaced and they can be whatever, but you know, data flow is, is, is value. We all know the data is value nowadays, you know. That's why people, we gather more and more, try to mine more and more value out of them, okay? So, what we need to understand when we, when we brainstorm this, then, is, for, is first to try to understand the intents, okay? The intents means, I mean, to find the intents, I see, we should look for things like communication, who's communicating with who, who's conversa conversations, like that sort of, sort of session type of conversations, expectations, contracts between the different parties, when we have transfer of, of, con of control. These are usually hints for, for intents. Okay, and we should also look for facts then. And facts are usually, I mean, hints for facts are usually state, history, causality, as I've already said. I mean, I mean why something happened in the relation to X, Y, etc. Notifications, and also so transfer of state, in sort of contrary to transfer of control. And intents are usually represented as commands, while facts are usually represented as events. Okay? So this is sort of a good model to, to know what to look for when you, when, you, when, you, when you think about these things. But let's try to understand the difference between commands and events a little bit better. I mean, most people have heard about it. Perhaps not everyone knows the actual difference in, in, in semantics and meaning. Okay? So, sorry. C command is sort of the object form of, of, an, of your sort of a method call. Or, or, or an action request, okay? It's, 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 it's a verb, you know, and it should be phrased in the imperative. Things like, I mean, sort of common names are things like create order, ship product, etc. Sort of the intent to do something, that I want someone to do something for me, okay? However, we sort of, so, and the, and the flow is often then that when, the, when, when, that, the, when, when these commands are sort of accepted by, by some sort of component, some sort of service, et cetera, that usually causes some sort of reaction. You know, commands are all about, the intent of a command is to do side effecting, and that asks someone else to do something, you know, that has some sort of reaction, causes some sort of effect, okay? So, it rep so, so th and that reaction, however, that sort of side effect, usually then emits and creates, is represented as, you might say, an event, okay? Because an event represents that something has already happened. That, that's sort of the, the, the fact, so to speak, that the reaction happened and completed, okay? And events are usually for, sort of phrased in past tense, order created, that the order has been created, compared to create order, this, that's sort of the, ob I'm trying to oblige someone to do something for me, okay? And, or product shipped, et cetera. So they have very different meanings sem semantically, and they also very different meaning when it comes to how you design the system, et cetera, okay? But let, let's dig a little bit deeper here. Uh, so commands are really all about intent, while events, they're totally intentless, okay? They just represent the, some, the fact that something has already happened. Commands are directed, you know? I wanna tell someone specifically to do something. It can be one or many, but, but they are really, sort of specific in terms of, of, of their direction, while events are fully anonymous, okay? Commands are, they have a single addressable destination. I'm sending it to a specific point, asking a specific service to do something. Events, they just happens for anyone to observe that might be interested. It can be zero, it can be 100, it can be 1,000, can be whatever, it can be all the different sort of uh, intents for uh, subscribing to the events as well, etc. okay? Commands, they model personal communication, okay? While events, they model broadcast, so to speak. Speaker's corner, I'm me standing up here talking to you. I'm just sort of broadcasting events, and you can sort of choose to accept them as facts or ignore them, hopefully the, the, the former. And commands, they, then they have a distributed focus, you know? They move between contexts, very often across the network, while events, 
they, are, they have a local focus. You just, they are just, the, the services just emit the event locally, where they, where, they, where, where they happen to be. Okay, no addressable destinations or anything like that, it's just local. So if you actually want uh, to have events transfer across the network, then you have to wrap them in messages and send them over and pretend that they happened over there. Are you following with me? Okay. Commands are really all about command and control. I want, I want to oblige someone to do something for me. Okay. Hope you better you know, do as I say. While events are really all about autonomy. And that's one of the keys to why I think events can really help us build truly available, available systems because it, 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 it breaks free of the coupling of commands. Okay. Not saying the commands are bad, they have their place. But I personally favor to, to start thinking in events and, 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 and try to design my system using events as much as possible just because it gives me a, a greater path towards autonomy and, lo and loose recoupling. Okay? So, let us, let, let's do, so we should listen, let the, the events d define our bounded context. Which events come in and which events come out. And we do that by, def by defining and working hard at, at finding the right protocols for these, these, for these boundaries. It's, it's extremely important. And, 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 and because if we do this right, events can actually help us to invert the control it, and put the, ser the service itself in charge. You know, I can choose which events I accept. No one can oblige me to do anything, really. Okay? So it, serves, so it gives us an in inversion of control that can be really helpful when designing these type of systems. Okay? So, but, so, but what are the characteristics of an event-driven service then? Yeah, first, so event, an event-driven service then sort of can receive and react then if you, if you choose to, events that sort of come into it, or, or commands, right? Uh, so essentially, react to facts. And it, and it can also, after the reaction that it's actually done something, it, sort of, it can sort of create a new fact representing the fact you know, that something happened. You know, it's, it, it performs some sort of operation, and, and as, as a result of that, it creates a new fact. And then it can choose to publish that to the world, okay, in an asynchronous fashion. As I said already, it's already inverse this control flow and minimize the coupling, which is really, really helpful. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about immutable events here. Some people might, might think, then what about mutable state? I mean, I'm used to thinking immutable state, and I'm used to thinking in terms of, 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 of of a more imperative type of code. Uh, there might be a lot of functional programmers here as well, but most people are probably from an imperative background. But I have to say that mutable state is still fine, you know? But the important thing here, the key thing, and that it needs to be contained. It needs to be non-observable to the rest of the world. As long as you contain mutable state, you know, you confine it to the service, it's fine, you can use it. It's more intuitive for a lot of people, you can actually have performance improvements, et cetera, to do, to do processing, et cetera. But it needs to be contained in sort of this safe haven, not observable to the, to the rest of the world. And, you know, when you have accepted a fact, and, and, and sort of you do your processing, and you sort of, you end up with the, with, with the result, then you can choose then to create a fact out of that the fact that something's already happened, and then you publish that to the outside world, you know? This means that, that other components can rely on stable values. They can re rely on the reasoning of things that you won't change, you know? If you publish mutable things, that means that things can change right under the hood, right on, right on the eyes, you know, of, of the guys using it. And that sort of makes for very, for very, for very brittle protocols. By, but, but, but by sort of communicating only through facts, I mean, you get really reliable, stable um, sort of communication pro protocols. And how do we model this then in DDD? In DDD, I mean, you know, people talk about you know, services and, and you know, bounded context, and, and, and the aggregate is where you put your, sort of your state normally. I mean, that's usually persisted down, down, down to disk. So it's, I think the aggregate is the, is the perfect sort of keeper of your events, so to speak. It maintains the integrity and the consistency of your service. It is sort of our unit of consistency, it's our unit of failure as well. What I mean by that is that if, if an aggregate fails, it needs to fail as a whole. It can't fail partially, 
Okay? Because that means that, that, that you might end up in a fully inconsistent fashion within yourself, which is really a bad thing. Okay? So, so, it, so it's, it's really an either or thing. And, and it's really a sort of, and if, if we sort of adhere to that and make sure that if, 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 an, if an aggregate fails, it fails as a whole, that means that we can actually sort of ensure strong consistency within, within the aggregate, which is, which is essential in order to be able to reason with, uh, you know, sanely across the in services in, in, in a distributed system. So then it becomes for our unit of determinism. We can assure, ensure that within our service, we have full determinism. And I'll get back to why this is important later, okay? It also gives us full autonomy, which means that the entity, the entity can come and go without sort of, or fail and, 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 and sort of bounce back without affecting any other services in the system, which is extremely important. So, so that was a lot of theory. So let's try to dive in a little bit, you, you know, practically what, what, what it can look like when event-driven services communicate. Let's say we have some, some sort of user here. The user might be another service. It might be another system. It might be actually a physical human sending a request in, okay? So it sends that by command. It wants to do something, okay? That command ends up on the, ends up on the mailbox of the service, and some sort of action is triggered, okay? Out of that action is we create an event, okay? And we publish that to our event stream, our event bus, sort of, or, 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 da or data fabric. You, you might call it whatever you like. I, I, I call it event stream, okay? And then, you know, this event stream sort of relays that event to anyone that might be interested, everyone that has sub sub subscribed to that. And as sort of, that means that the events is relayed to, to, the, to the other services mailboxes, triggers an action of, of some sort that might also trigger an event, et cetera. You know, there might be an event sent back to the, to the user now completing the, the task, et cetera, or sent out to some other service to, to, to continue to perform some sort, so, some sort of function. It's also important that it doesn't necessarily need to be services that sort of su subscribe to these events. It might be some sort of external uh, system or some, or in this case, a database, for example. It might be H HDFS because, I mean, we have, we, we, we have the data processing sort of, sort of services uh, that runs nightly, for example, doing data mining on whatever events happen in the system, et cetera. Uh, or, or, or it might be other type of services, for ex ex external services, et cetera. I mean, so the, 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 the really interesting thing here, though, is that this model requires a mindset that is, that, that sort of, it, it, it is at peace with eventual consistency, you know? Because, because all these events, the commands flow in a fully asynchronous fashion. Which, which might take some time to wrap, wrap your head around if you're, if, if you're used to monolithic services or, or monolithic systems, et cetera, okay? But the event stream used in this fashion is great for a lot of things. It can, it can be used as our, com, com, uh, 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 as our communication fabric. It can be used as our integration fabric, integrating with other systems, et cetera. It can use, be used as our replication fabric to replicate data for availability. Okay? It can be used as our consensus fabric to make, to make sense of, of the state across a distributed system, etc. It can also be used as a persistence fabric to actually give you really available, reliable uh, uh, sort of data, pro data persistence, being the sor actual source of truth. I'll, I'll dive into this more later. Okay? So events are as persistent, some, some people might say then. Okay, but what's wrong with CRUD then? I'm, I'm actually used to using CRUD. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that CRUD is totally fine for totally isolated data. However, most services don't have totally isolated data. What I mean by totally isolated, I mean data that no other service might ever be interested in. Totally isolated data, okay? As soon as you, as you don't have that, as soon as you need to do some sort of cross cross-service consistency, okay, then, then I think CRUD completely breaks, breaks down. Why? Because it's really, really hard to do joins, okay? It gives us, I mean, you, we can, really can't use any of our old tricks, like normalization, joins, and all this, you know, all the, all the great things that we have in, in SQL that we just take for granted. That have, we have one single system image, you know? 
All that breaks down when, when you have split up your data sort of across multiple services with a network in between. Okay? It really gives us only ad hoc and very weak uh, consistency guarantees. Sometimes they're often too as so weak that they are unusable. Okay? I often you know, hear, hear customers com complain about this, though. The reality continues to ruin, to ruin my life. You know, the problem is that, as Pat Helen said, two-phase commit is the anti-availability protocol. It's, it's, it's extremely hard to build available systems using the distributed transaction, two-phase commit, et cetera. So we're maintaining, or it's actually the, sort of trying to pretend that, that the world is, is, is strongly consistent across the network. You know, that's an illusion that we've been living with for too long, I believe. It's, just, it's time that we, that we end that now and sort of accept the fact that, there, that the world is eventually consistent. There's really no such thing as strong consistency in the real world. It's just something we, we as developers try to shoehorn into our, our very sort of limited model of the world, and we are surprised when it falls apart. We shouldn't be, you know. It doesn't map how the reality actually, actually, actually works. Strong consistency is really the wrong default. As I said before, I mean, there's, rough, there's really nothing wrong with crowd. There's really nothing wrong per se with strong consistency. It, it can really help us to, to, to think in terms, you know, around hard concepts in computer science. It's a great thing for strong consistency. But I believe it's the wrong thing to start with when you design your system. Because it will lead you down the wrong path. Okay? It makes, yeah. I think it just makes things worse, so to speak. So what can we do then? Yeah, we really have to rely on eventual consistency from the start and then opt in on strong consistency when we have a chance, okay? Instead of the other way around. Start with strong consistency and try to loosen it up here and there for availability and, and scale, et cetera, okay? Because I really think it's actually how the world works, okay? We need to be better at sort of just embracing reality. In our design session, look at how the world actually works, not the way we want it to work you know, in order to, 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 to fit you know, the way we learn to design systems the last 10, 20 years. We should don't fight reality. We should embrace it. We will actually be better off in this new world of cloud computing and multi-core architectures where actually, we actually do have a distributed system right in the cores. You know, even, we, even though we don't think about it like that, okay? You know, it's a fact of life that, you know, information travels at the speed, at, at, at the speed of light, and that puts a limit on, on the speed of information in, 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 our, in, in our system. This means that information has latency. It's actually contrary than what Newton thought. But then later Einstein proved that, you know, it's all in the, in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. And this is a reality in systems today. It's not just some esoteric thing. I mean, it really affects systems today that this latency is, 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 is there. It's something that we need to think, of, to think about. You know, but when we think about it, you know, information is always from the past. You know? it's, it's really true for everything we observe in the, re in the real world. When we've seen something or hear something or, or experience something, it's already very often happened quite some time ago. There's always this delay. You know, so we're always sort of looking into the past. It's always in the eye of the beholder, you know? And this means that the present, the now, is actually relative. We're all experiencing different presents. Sorry for being going, going off or, 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 or philosophical on you here, but I really think that we need to fully embrace this view of the world, that there is no now, okay? Everything is relative. This means that when we design microservices system, we need to think about each service as having their own now, then that's, that is okay that it's not fully consistent across services, you know? Because as soon as we exit the boundary of the service, we enter this wild ocean of non-determinism, you know? That's the world of distributed systems. It's, it's, it's a quite scary world, you know, where systems fail in the most spectacular ways, intricate ways, you know, where, where messages get lost, never to be found again, you know, where messages get garbled, get, get reordered, et cetera. You know, and where failure detection is really nothing but a, a guessing game. You have really no clue for sure if a service that you talk to is down, or it's just doing GC, or it's out for lunch, or whatever. You know? And this might sound terrifying, but it's also this world, the space in between the services, the non-determinism between the services, that gives us tools for resiliency, elasticity, isolation, etc. Without this, there's really no isolation. 
etc., etc., right? So what I think what we need to do is find have better tools for modeling this uncertainty between the services. Because you know, a lot of people say, yeah, microservices is not that hard. It's just, you know, you know, you know generate a microservice, a gRPC or whatever, and I'm done. You know, no, I mean, the e, that's the easy part. The services themselves is the easy part. The hard part is the thing in between the microservices, okay? And yet again, I mean, we've learned the hard way not to hide complexities, you know, not to hide the network, for example. We tried that with RPC, it failed. We tried with Corba, EGBs, et cetera. The list, you know, is long. The graveyard of distributed systems, you know, things that didn't work. You know, it's always better to embrace the constraints, the constraints of the network, the constraints of reality, and, and, and work with things instead of trying to, you know, pretend that they're, they're, they're not there. So Pat Helen once said, you know, that, in a system which cannot count on distributed, distributed transactions, the management of uncertainty must be implemented in the business logic. You know, how, how in, the, in the protocols, how events flow between the systems, et cetera. And I really believe that events can lead to greater certainty in the system. You know, uh, Mark Burgess, he wrote this great book, In Search of Certainty. I really re recommend you to read it. He talks a lot about autonomy, and it is very applicable to this new world, okay? And, and where it says that an autonomous component can only promise its own behavior. Autonomy makes information local, which leads to greater certainty and stability. It's, it's, it's essentially, since if you, if you, what it says that if you're only relying on local information that's not coupled to anything else in the world, you're, then you're fully autonomous. You're in charge of your own decisions. Okay, and that's a really, really good thing. Okay. So events can really help us craft sort of these autonomous islands of determinism. That sort of shields us from this craziness, this crazy ocean of non-determinism, where you are safe, you know, where you can use mutable state, where things are strongly consistent, or things are fully deterministic, etc., where you can live happily under the illusion that, you know, there is, that, that, that time is absolute, that there is a single now, so to speak. And, it, and, and we need, in order to do that, we need to craft well-defined protocols, which events you accept and which events you emit, which facts you accept and which facts you emit, okay? The question though, I mean, how can we work with data across isolated services? How can we ensure consistency and consensus? Yeah, Pat Tellen, again, he has a really nice framework, I think, for how to think about consistency in this new world. So he talks about inside data as our current present. That's the state inside your service, okay? Then he talks about outside data as the blast from the past. You know, that's the events arriving to you, things that have already happened that you can choose to accept or ignore, okay? And then, we, then, then between services, he, 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 he talks about hope for the future, which is like almost poetic, you know, so I love that. You know, that's our commands, that someone sends a command hoping that someone else would care and do something about it, okay? So this is a really good way to mental model to think about these, these type of systems. It's also important to understand that a system of microservices is really a never-ending stream towards convergence. You will never ever re reach full convergence. You're always trying to catch up. You're always trying to reach that. You might actually reach it for a millisecond, but then you're, you're behind again, right? Because a system, is in constant motion. Data constantly arrives at faster and faster speeds, you know, and there really is no globally consistent now. So this is also a nice mental model, I think, in order to, to try to understand how to think about systems in this new world, okay? Another fundamental lesson I've learned the hard way is that resilience is by design, okay? The, 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 this is a photo of a, of a home in, in Christ, in Gilchrist in Texas. Uh, it, it was designed to, to sort of resist floodwaters. And, and, and you can see um, so when, when Hurricane Ike, I don't know if you remember that, in 2008 came in, it's one of the few houses that actually stood strong. Why? Because it was, de it was designed for resilience from the start, okay? And I really think that events can help us manage failure instead of trying to avoid it. I see way, 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 way too many times when people building, you know, systems, we try catch statements literally everywhere. I mean, we're trying to prevent, so we're really scared about failures, 
and we call them exceptions if they're, even though they're really not exceptional at all, they are almost gu gu guaranteed to happen. And, and as a reason, sort of, sort of, sort of, our, our codes are literally sort of, uh, sort of we scatter try catches across our code base everywhere. But I really think that that's sort of the fundamentally wrong way to think, to think about failure. Failure is, is sort of nothing to be scared about. It's, not, it's, it's inevitable. I mean, it will happen, even if you don't like it or not. It's better to, to think about how to manage failure than trying to work hard to prevent it all the time, you know, being scared about, of, of it. It's actually a natural state in the application lifecycle, in the, in, the, in the services lifecycle. I mean, it's, you, have, you have start, you have stop, you have resume, you have fail, you know. And if, if you draw it up as a, as a, as a, as a state machine, and, 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 and if you then end up in the failed state, you know that, oh, this was actually accept, um, expected. And you know exactly how to get out of there. Instead of being scared, you know that everything will blow, will blow up. And I really believe that f e events and this isolation that microservices gives us can really help with building these type of reliable systems. You know, and, and, and I think the requirements that I have for a for, for, for sane failure model compared to you know, this, this strong coupling that we have often have in, mo in monoliths with one, one failure can like, you know, blow the whole call stack all the way up in the user's face, is that failures need to be contained, fully contained, isolated to avoid cascading failures. They need to be reified as events. They need to be signaled asynchronously to whoever might be interested in learning that I just died, okay? And they need to be then observed, ideally by, by at least one, but why not by many, okay? And then they need to be managed so outside of the, of the failed context. And, this, and here we have the network as a really good boundary between the failed component or the failed service and ourselves. You know? and, and, it's, and there's no surprise that this model is very much as I talked about in event-driven services. If you look at, if you see failure like this, just being an event, that means that it will fit right into the rest of the workflow. It's just an event flowing, it's just business logic. Instead of you know coming sort of emitting events you know for, from the result that you just computed to whoever's interested, you emit an event say oh okay I couldn't complete this I just died sorry to to whoever might be interested. There's nothing exceptional about the the way information flows you know when it comes to failures either. It just fits right into it, and 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 you have a really good way of managing failure failure this way. Finally, event, event, I was going to talk a little bit about event-based persistence because it's, it's something that people talk a lot about, but not perhaps everyone uh, knows exactly what it means. So how, one, one, one question that, that, I, that I get a lot is like, how can we transition from a crowd-based system to a more, a more event-driven system? Okay? As I said, I think it's fine to use crowd. But if you want to use it to sort of more and work towards a more event-driven system, uh, a really nice pattern is to combine that with event stream, the event stream that I just showed you in these illustrations some, 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 some time ago. Okay? And you can use that to get sort of an internally consistent materialized view of the world. So I'll try to illustrate what I mean here. If, if, let's say we have two services, service A and service B. Both of them are using CRUD. Okay, sort of storing data in table A and table B, let's say. And here, and both of them have sort of a hook to our event bus. Okay. Let, now, when, when, when service A in CRUD stores some, some record in table A, it also, in an atomic fashion, that's important, pushes that change out to the event bus. Okay. It's an either or. Either both of these operations fails or, or, or not, none of them fails. If we have that in place, you know, we are on a good path here. Because then, in the, in, let's say the service, the service B here also wants to sort of do, do, the same, do, do the same thing, right? Then in service C, service C is interested in updates of both sort of, oops, uh, service A and service B here, okay? So, it's, then it sort of just subscribes to the events from both of these event streams. And it can then it, it, itself internally join table A and table B. The, all the records that have been stored there eventually, because this is also eventually consistent, sort of ends up in, in services C own, own an internal table as a, as, a, as a join. And then it can serve the user 
uh, using this, this materialized view, so to speak. But it's also very important here that this is still eventually consistent. So we, doesn't, we, we don't solve the problem of, of having strong consistency across the network. We just in sort of loosening up the guarantees a little bit and we're on a path towards marriage, some marrying CRUD with uh, a more event-based way, way of thinking, okay? But I think we can do better. I mean, Jim Gray once said that update in place strikes system designer as a cardinal sin. It violates the account, traditional accounting principles that's been used, uh, that, 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 that's been observed for hundreds of years. You know, the, 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 pro, the main problem with CRUD is update in place. That we actually have destructive update, you know? And yet again, I think we need to relearn and learn from the real world. We relearn basic accounting principles, how things have actually, these things have been done on pen and paper for hundreds of years, okay? Pat Helen also said that, that the truth is the log. The database is a cache of the subset of the log. The question is why work with the cache of the subset when you could work with the real thing? I mean, there is a reason why we use update in place, you know? Disk space used to be expre extremely expensive. So there was a reason that you actually have to preserve disk space. But today, disk space is incredibly cheap. There's no reason to, 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 to throw away historic data. And here, the event log can really, really be a great thing. A really real event log in here can be sort of the bedrock on which we can build a lot of the hard things here, like consistency, like availability, scalability, and traceability, et cetera. And you know, event log is all about storing each event in order as they arrive, on disk, so in, 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 in a sort of durable ledger, okay? Like, just like a transaction log is used you know, in, in Oracle or, or, or any sort of SQL database. It's just that we, we expose it to us as developers right off. And a great pattern on top of event logging is something called event sourcing. It sits, I mean, sort of, that's, it, and that can work sort of as a cure for this cardinal sin of destructive updates. And it's really that you log, it, it works that you log all state changing events in the event log. Everything that will update the state of your, the internal state of, of, your, of your component, right? So we use it to back up the, the aggregates. This will give us a way to have strong consistency within each, each service backed by a durable event log, okay? but we can have eventual consistency between the aggregates. So I think it really gives us the best of, the, of both worlds. And so um, the way it works is that, let's say we have the happy path first. In the, in the, in the happy path, we first receive and verify the command. Let's say it's, it's, it's an approved payment. We, we create the event, sort of representing uh, that, that uh, action that, 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 that we're about to do. Let's call it payment approved. We append it to the event log, and then so we update in our internal component state, and then finally we're on the, we're on the side effects to, to whatever, the fire, fire the nukes or whatever. However, in the, in the sad path, when we want to recover from failure, for example, we want to re replay it because we wanted to replicate it uh, for redundancy, etc., cetera, or, or re replay it for debuggability, or, et cetera. I mean, then the only thing we do, we, do a re we rerun sort of stage three, we rehydrate the event from the event log, and we update the internal component state. We don't run the side effects again. We just bring it back where it were when it failed, okay? And this is something that Martin Fowler uh, uh, sometimes called me the memory image pattern, in, in which you can have, you know, your, your, your service having in mem an in, like just in-memory data, you know, but it's still durably persisted on disk for full availability. And the, and the nice thing here is that we have one single source of truth for all our history in the, in, that's ever happened in, the, in these service and in, and in all services. It allows for this durable in-memory state that can be extremely fast, you know, and it's extremely easy to work with because it avoids this, you know, this infamous object relational impedance mismatch. There's no reason to map your objects or your, 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 your sort of runtime representation down to tables anymore which also saves a lot of time and a lot of hassles. And, and it also allows others to subscribe on these, on the, on these, on these state changes, okay? I mean, there, there, there might be others that might be interested in it. You know, other, other, sort of others, other, other type of systems, you know, running Hadoop jobs later on, on, the, on, the, on the full data set, you know, the join of all your services, et cetera, et cetera. 
It also tends, event log in general, tends to have very good mechanical sympathy. Mechanical sympathy is sort of coined by Martin Thompson. But what it means is that it's sort of the pattern or the way design software sort of matches very well with how modern hardware works. You know, the event logging gives you sort of a way to have a like single writer writing right down to disk in order, you know, fully, fully uncontended. And you know, if, if you've been around the block, if, if, b building sort of concurrent systems or distributed systems for a while, you know that contention is the biggest scalability killer. And, and also contention you know, con con it can also really bring down availability, et cetera. So, Another great, sorry, great pattern on top, uh, or in tandem, I'd say, with, uh, with uh, event sourcing is a pattern called CQRS. You know, CQRS gives us a great tool for the problem of, 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 of when, of sort of, uh, sort of it, it gives us a great tool for sort of separating reads and writes. It might be, you know, the, your, the reads in the system might have very different characteristics than writes, than the writes uh, sort of uh, uh, characteristics, both in terms of consistency, performance, availability, et, et cetera. CQRS sort of allows you to decouple these worlds and store both of these, the read side and the write side, in the optimal format for its purpose, so to, so, so to, so to, so to speak. You know, you might, for example, have a, have a, have a read-heavy system. You know, then, then you can sort of choose to scale out the read side independently of the, of the write side. Uh, Etc. Instead of having all, all lumped together, it makes it really hard to give, just like turn, turn the right knobs. You still need to scale out both at, at the same time, etc. And, and you know, uh, if you, if you so combine this with event sourcing, that, that, mean, that, mean, that means that you can use the, the event log as a right side. We already talked a lot about that. that it's a really f good fit for storing events in, 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 in an event driven system. However, Event logging makes it really hard to do queries, to do joins, et cetera. And this is why CQRS comes in very handy, because it allows us to store the, the read model in an optimal format for reading. And, and that's often, you know, an RDBMS, a, rel a relation database, or, or, a, no, or a NoSQL database, or, or, or a graph database, or something like that. No. So let's say that we have, we have, we have a user here that sends the commands to the right side model here. The right side then just writes it down to the event log in order, very fast, very convenient. The, it, it also then sort of, when, and once it's done that, it sort of emits an event saying, I just, I, I just store this in my event log. Who's, who's, who's interested, okay? Then it might be another system here, the read side model that, that's interested in this, in, this, in this update. And it can sort of subscribe to that and then choose to store that in the ultimate format for the read side, often a SQL database or Cassandra or something like that, and then, and then serve that model to the user. So you can do queries using you know, tr traditional SQL, for example, while still reaping all the benefits of, of the event-driven design for, for, the, for, the, for the durable data storage. Once again, here, it's important to understand there's eventual consistency between these two subsystems. So there, so there might be, you know, a delay for queries. You might not even be read your own rights, et cetera. This, of course, ways to, to add layer of reliability to that, using stuff like Raft or things like that, you know. But uh, the bare bones, you know, view of this is that it's eventually consistent between. Uh, so events can also really help us manage time, which is also a quite interesting thing. You know, Greg Young once said that modeling events forces you to have a temporal focus on what's going on in the system, where time becomes a crucial factor in the system. And, and what I mean by that is events, the real, event sourcing really allows us to model time in a nice way, where event can be sort of, event is our snapshot in time. You know, the latest event is, is where we are right now, right? And event ID can be an index of the time, so the cursor, how time flows through the system. And the event log is our full history, you know, with everything that's ever happened. Is our database of the past as well as the database of the present? while regular SQL, data, but SQL databases are just the database of the present, discarding the past, okay? And, and, one, and finally, one interesting thing is that it really allows for time travel, okay? Where you can, where you can have things like, 
You can replay the log for historic debugging, for auditing, for full, for, for full traceability, understandable what went wrong and why it went wrong. Just replay the event log, bring a component up to state. You can replay it slowly, et cetera. You can replay the log on failure. You can replay or, or the, sort of bring the component up to the state where it was. You can replay it for replication as well. You have all kind of replicas. All that is essentially free because you, all you need is subscribers to the event log and choose to sort of replay it at any point. So, so I'm, I, I just want to give you the key takeaways here. If events first design helps you sort of reduce risk when modernizing application. I really be, believe that it's an enabled to move faster into this new world. So towards a, a resilient and fully scalable architecture by designing autonomous services, by you should invert the control flow compared to, to regular systems. It allows you to balance certainty and uncertainty and avoid things like, like, like CRUD and ORM, this impedance mismatch, et cetera. Take control of your system's history, et cetera, and, and uh, balance sort of strong and eventual consistency, in, 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 which is really the hardest thing you can do, I think, in a, in, in a d distributed system in general. Um, I mean, I, I, I personally come, come, come from experience learning this the hard way using ACA. ACA is a great toolkit for that. Uh, to, give, to build like autonomous resilient services based on the actor model. You can just go and check it out on ACA.io. I, I won't give you any more plugs about that. If you want to learn more about this, I wrote this mini book that's, that's free. It's, free. it's freely available on O'Reilly. It, it, give, it goes down into a little bit of more detail. So you can download here at Bitly Reactive Microsystems. So that's all I had. Sorry for being over time a minute. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>